Welcome to tonight's event at the German Center for Research and Innovation, DWIH. Uh, I'm still getting used to the rebranding, DWIH. Welcome to the last event at the German Center for Research and Innovation for this year. So you're in for a treat. Uh, you're in for a, for a fun evening of, of discussion and new technologies, but also art and uh, cutting edge uh, discourses around uh, technological trends and whatnot. Uh, I am as excited as you are to sit here and listen, so I'll keep my remarks short. But again, this is our last event of 2018, and I think it's going to be uh, a special one. Uh, as many of you know, but some of you don't know, my name is uh, Gerhard Rössler. I'm the program manager here at the German Center. Um, and. Uh, and yeah, extend a very warm welcome. Um, our first event next year, for those of you who are already, already curious about 2019, uh, will be in February, so you can take a long, nice rest from our events and then come back all refreshed uh, in, in February for an event on multilingualism, multilingualism multilingualism and the uh, mega city. Sorry, I should have practiced that one. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a good one, multilingualism. Uh, the German Center is in here in New York is one of five centers worldwide. Uh, we're also in Tokyo, in Moscow, in Sao Paulo, and in New Delhi. And uh, as a worldwide network, which is managed by the German Academic Exchange Service, we'd like to promote German research and innovation and be a platform for dialogue and exchange uh, for uh, these two, for the world community of uh, science. If you feel like I'm not at my A-game today, it's because my predecessor, John Halpern, is sitting here. It's kind of like having your, having your uh, the, the inventor of the product that you're selling uh, watch you uh, do your talking. So, um, uh, so just as a very quick review on 2018, we look back at about 20 public events. That's a lot of public events, plus conferences that we attend, plus things that weren't public that you maybe not were privy to. Uh, so we, we had a very successful, very uh, full year. And as I mentioned, uh, we're, built, we're standing on the shoulder of giants here, or a particular giant. Uh, and so uh, I'm very excited that today's event we do together with the House of Plutner Institute here in New York, uh, with the New York office of which uh, is run by my predecessor, whom you all know and love, uh, uh, Dr. Joanne Halpern, uh, which is why I'll cut my remarks short here. Uh, thank you for the speakers for coming, uh, some, some of you for just one day from Germany all the way. Uh, so thank you for coming. The speakers will be introduced a little bit more later on along with the topic. Uh, but now I'll give a uh, very warm welcome back. Welcome back to the GCRI to John Halpern. Thank you. Thank you, Garrett, for that, that really kind introduction. And Garrett's doing an excellent job. So. Um, so as Garrett mentioned, I used to work here at the GCRI. And one of the things we did every year was decide on the focus areas for the next year and the newsletter topics for each month. And when we were doing that, we were looking at the most cutting edge topics that were relevant for Germany and the United States. Well, some of these areas included digital health, human computer interaction, artificial intelligence machine learning, algorithm engineering, industry 4.0, and cybersecurity, to name a few. One of the locations in Germany that embodies all of the aforementioned topics is the Hasso Plattner Institute for Digital Engineering, or HPI. So it's not a coincidence that after I left GCRI, I joined HPI. It was a great decision. Um, so HPI, whose CEO and director, Professor Christoph Meinl, um, is going to be speaking this evening, is Germany's University Excellence Center for Digital Engineering, and is a faculty of the University of Potsdam. We offer masters, bachelors, PhDs, and we have postdocs and professors with global reputations. HPI's reputation for excellence was in full view two weeks ago when Chancellor Merkel and her cabinet had their meeting on digitalization and AI, or in, for those of you who speak German, it's called the Digitalklausur. And it was, where did they have it? At HPI. And the finance minister, he came in on his bicycle. All the others came in with their bodyguards and their limousines. He came with his bodyguards on his bicycle. 
and who, where were the headlines about the finance minister and his bicycle. <laughs> um, and, and not only did they have this meeting on digitalization and AI, but they also passed Germany's AI strategy there. And what a perfect place to talk about AI at, you know, as HPI, at HPI. And um, why? Because the research as well as the products coming out of HPI, such as School Cloud, Health Cloud, our MOOC platform, by the way, we have, our MOOCs are all free, our MOOC platform and many other innovations. And those of you, some of you this, morning, this, afternoon, this evening came to me and said, Twin, I don't really understand what blockchain is. If you speak German and don't know what blockchain is or want to learn more about blockchain, there is a MOOC that Professor Meinl and two of his colleagues um, created on blockchain. And at, soon it'll be in English, I hope. Right now it's in German, but you know, I'm also not an expert and it really, I, I got it. You, many of you go to blockchain events and you hear lectures and they often cover the same topics. But with the blockchain MOOC, they go much deeper, but in a way that non-IT experts can understand. So I highly recommend it. Um, so, getting back to the event tonight, um, so what enhances the quality of many of the innovations at HPI is our D School, or our School for Design Thinking. Um, and, you know, some of you might know the D School at Stanford. Well, who financed the D School at Stanford? Hasso Plattner. He also financed our D School. And, um, you know, and, and the D School, um, it was the very first in Europe. And here at HPI in New York, we are soon going to be offering coaching certificates in design thinking. So keep your eyes open and um, you can also contact us afterwards and we can talk to you more about that. So in addition to New York City, HPI has international centers in Haifa, Israel, Cape Town, South Africa, and Nanjing in China. And that's why Professor Meinl is traveling around the world all the time because we have all these centers. And finally, I'd like to thank all of those who are instrumental in making this event possible. Our speakers, of course, we have here Nana Decking, Amy Whitaker, Sophie Scherlink, those are our, and, and you will also see, of course, Professor Meinl. And fine, also I'd like to thank the GCRI team, Gerrit Rusla, um, Nadia Ulrich, Jared Johnson, and Luisa Kruger, and also and thank you for the terrific collaboration. It's really been wonderful working with all of you. Um, they really have their team is really strong here. Um, and also Dmitry Zamanakov is an HPI student who's now an interning at SAP. Um, he's also been very helpful. And finally, Louisa Wood Ruby. Where, Louisa, where are you? I saw you somewhere. Okay, Louisa Wood Ruby. She's head of research at the Frick, Ref, Frick Art Reference Library here in New York. And the idea for this panel discussion was generated during a conference that Louisa organized in collaboration with the HPI. And, um, and Nana was one of the speakers, Professor Meinl was one of the speakers. And that's where this, the genesis of this, this uh, event was. And now I'm going to finally introduce our moderator. Sophie Schierling is the managing director of TAFAF New York, the American edition of the prestigious Dutch Art Fair in Maastricht. Um, you have her full bio in front of you, so I'm just gonna mention one thing. Um, before she joined TAFAF, she worked at a number of leading art platforms for the art industry. Um, so that's why you see, you see the connection to tonight's event. Okay, so Sophie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Joanne, and thank you, Garrett, um, the Hasso Plattner Institute and the German Center for Research Innovation for organizing and for hosting us tonight. Um, the title of this evening is The Work of Art in the Age of Blockchain. This is, of course, a reference to Vata Benjamin's seminal 1936 essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. Um, in it, Benjamin really comes to terms with art during a time of just extreme political, socioeconomic, and technological change. Um, maybe this will disappoint you, but we're not gonna be discussing the finer points of aura and fascism tonight. <laughs> I do think, though, um, that we can agree that you know, global politics, economics, and technological advancements still really very much impact how we create and consume and exchange, buy, and sell art today. So tonight we'll be focusing specifically on the impact of blockchain on art and the art industry. Our panelists will be giving 12-minute presentations <laughs> in the style of the Impose Referat. 
Um, followed by a panel discussion. After that, I'll open the floor for Q&A. Um, and then, of course, very important, we'll have drinks. Um, so on to introducing our speakers. Um, so Amy Whitaker is in front of her picture. Um, she is a professor in visual arts administration at NYU and has been a business strategy mentor to TED Fellows and grantees of the Joan Mitchell Foundation. Um, holding both an MBA and an MFA, Amy focuses on the intersection of art, business, and technology. She has written and lectured very widely on blockchain and art. She's published two books, countless articles. Um, most recently, she's been researching how blockchain can enable artists to hold on to equity in their work in the marketplace long after the initial sale. Um, so welcome, Amy. <laughs> Um, I'll move on with Nana. Nana Decking is the founder and CEO of Artery, a startup which is leveraging blockchain to build a secure digital registry of verified information on art and collectibles. He will unpack that for you. I don't need to do that right now. Um, he's also the chairman of the board of the Tafaf Art Fair. Um, prior to startup life, uh, he was worldwide head of private sales at Sotheby's, and he also spent many years as vice president of the prestigious Wildenstein Gallery. Nana strives to grow the art market through th transparency, uh, and he believes in healthy disruption from within. <laughs> um, Dr. Meinl is the CEO and scientific director of the Hasso Plattner Institute, dean of the digital engineering faculty at the University of Potsdam, and a director of the Stanford D School. Um, he is professor at all of these institutions, um, as well as a few universities in China. He has authored hundreds of books, anthologies, conferences, papers. Um, his research is focused on security engineering, knowledge engineering, Web 3.0, and innovation research in the field of design thinking. Um, so without further ado, um, we are going to start with Amy's presentation. Thank you very sincerely for the invitation to be here. I'm very honored to be part of this event. I'll hope to keep my remarks very brief. What I wanted to do is to offer a little bit of a philosophical or poetic introduction to blockchain. Perhaps if you might be convinced as an art project unto itself, uh, an art project we're all living inside of as we talk about how to apply it to the arts. And then also to talk a little bit about some of the work that I have done that led me to be interested in this. Many people credit the history of blockchain as starting with the publication in 2009 of the Bitcoin white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto, variously considered to be a person, a group of people, a pseudonym. This paper has eight footnotes. Um, and one of the footnotes, uh, excuse me, three of the footnotes are to the work of two researchers and mostly to this particular paper, which is called How to Time Stamp a Digital Document. This paper was published in 1991 based on research in the late 1980s and a presentation in cryptography conference world in 1990. And there is a colleague of mine in the broad sense at NYU, David Yermak, um, who is the chair of the finance department, who has been teaching a class in conjunction with the law school at NYU for, in blockchain world, sort of like the way that, you know, a, dog, a dog's life is one year to seven years. It's like, you know, for, in blockchain world for like a half a century, but really for four or five years. And when he was preparing for class a few years ago, he looked at the footnotes in the Satoshi paper and then pulled up this paper and noticed that the address is Morristown, New Jersey. Uh, Professor Yermak also lives in Morristown, New Jersey, and so on a lark, he emailed one of the authors. And that author, Scott Stornetta, uh, who works as a math teacher at a high school in Morristown, New Jersey, uh, emailed him back and said, let's meet and let's meet at the local friendlies. And um, so Professor Yermak said, um, you know, I know this friendlies. This is where I take my children for ice cream on their birthdays. And uh, Cernetta uh, refers to it still as the blockchain friendlies because this is the place where he came up with the idea for the blockchain. Um, and when I say he came up with it, I, I mean this in the artistic sense, but also in the sense that 
if we have a myth of artistic genius that um, there's so, solo innovation, um, he was very much working in a team, and he was working in a team most directly with a man named Stuart Haber. So Stuart Haber is a cryptographer, and uh, Scott Stornetta is a physicist by training. They worked together starting in the mid to late 1980s at Belcor in New Jersey. So I'd have to go into a two hour history of corporate M&A transactions to explain, but I think that that is basically sort of an offshoot of the legendary Bell Labs. And that meant that even though they had to kind of fight for it a little bit with their elbows to have space, they were tasked with trying to research things that were genuinely of interest to them. And you have to imagine in the late 1980s, personal computing was coming online and uh, they had this worry. And I think in the, the current kind of geopolitical and news environment, this worry is especially prescient and resonant. And the worry was, how will we know what is true about the past? Digital files are so easy to replicate. How, how will we know? So they, they also said, how will we know what is true, or to replicate or to alter? Uh, how will we know what was true about the past without having to trust a central authority to be the keeper of the files? And so they worked and worked to try to do this. Uh, Haber had actually been part of the original team that came up with a part of the relevant technology called zero knowledge proofs, which is essentially how to compare two things without knowing their contents, to know they match without revealing them. Um, and they worked and they worked and they could not figure out how to do this. And this is very frustrating uh, to scientists uh, of, of the caliber you know, we're surrounded uh, by right now and that they certainly are um, and so they decided to formally disprove it. They decided to prove that it was not possible. And that's what they were doing when Stornetta went to Friendly's. I've showed you a picture of Friendly's for a very long time. Uh, when he went to Friendly with, with his family and figured out that you could do this if you had a distributed ledger. So if you had a distributed ledger of time-stamped records that were in blocks, um, and many people had copies of it, you could in fact keep it secure without a central authority. That is the technology that is the basis of the Bitcoin white paper, which adds a crucial innovation of mining so that people are financially incentivized to keep track of this distributed ledger. Uh, the artistic part of this story that I, I really admire uh, is that Haber and Sornetta, and I should say I've been to this friendlies uh, with Sornetta and his, his wife, Marcia, um, Haber and Sornetta uh, spun out a company from Belcor. Belcor owned the patents that they developed, but they, they licensed their use and they started a company called Surety that timestamped documents. Uh, they timestamped uh, lab results, for example, for chemistry companies. And they didn't have to publish it in the newspaper, um, but they decided to just as a belt and suspenders version of making sure this was secure. So they're basically publishing uh, the hash or the mathematical code that somebody could use to kind of reverse engineer knowing that the record, the ledger had not been tampered with. And they have since, I think the mid 1990s, been publishing this in the New York Times, Sunday International Edition, Lost and Found. Um, I consider this the oldest blockchain in the world. And as a sidebar, when they first tried to do this, it was close enough to the Cold War era that they initially were turned down by the advertising department of the New York Times. And Haber had been interviewed by a science reporter and he breached the advertising editorial wall and asked, um, asked the reporter to vouch for him uh, so that they could publish this, this strange code. Um, so they never uh, profited directly at the time. They were, they were ahead of their time, the way that many artists are. Um, and they're very active researchers and advisors now and, and uh, doing really interesting work. Um, but Surety still um, operates quietly, but um, someone in about 2003 forgot to pay a patent maintenance fee. And if they had paid it, the blockchain itself would have been under US patent the first year of the Satoshi white paper. And so I, I offer this as the sort of um, technological story that maps onto 
maybe the experience of many artists. And one of the classic stories of this uh, is the story of Robert Rauschenberg, who sold a painting called Thaw in 1958 through the Leo Castelli Gallery for $900 to the collectors Robert and Ethel Skull, who resold the work at a marquee auction in Sotheby Park Burnett in 1973 for $85,000. Uh, Rauschenberg, arguably, his career had helped contribute to that increase in value for the work, but uh, he did not own any of that increase. He, he allegedly kind of shoved a uh, skull at the sale. And um, this is the basis of the U.S. conversation around resale, ro resale royalties. Uh, we do not have the concept of moral rights in our copyright law. Um, but I, I started thinking about this because there are a number of cases that have circulated in recent years in which artists have been involved in having to authenticate uh, works of art for market purposes. Um, you may have seen this case in which the Scottish artist Peter Doig um, was asked, taken to court in the United States uh, and asked to authenticate a work that was by Pete Doig. Um, that was made by a prisoner in Canada in the 1970s and owned by a prison guard jointly uh, with a gallerist in Chicago. And uh, Peter Doig won the case. Um, this, they were trying to sell this work for five to $10 million. Um, this is an example of Doig's work uh, selling at auction uh, for a couple of times that price point. Um, uh, but Peter Doig himself said, you know, that a living artist has to defend the authorship of his own work should never have come to pass. Um, and so I started thinking about what would happen if artists became owners, if artists were formalized as investors in their own work. So instead of being paid resale royalties, they became equity investors. And instead of selling a work for $100 and taking a 50% share, they sold it for 90, took $40 and owned 10% equity. Um, and some of the work that I do is actually archivally based, um, but uh, has, has applications on blockchain that are complementary to some of the other things I think we'll discuss tonight. So I find old records of original sales. These are the Jasper Johns notes that Leo Costelli made. I'd just like to say this is the absolutely beautiful uh, catalog resume um, that's partly uh, supported by the Plotner Wildenstein Institute. Uh, or is supported by them and published by Yale. Um, and to me, this is the artistic heart of how we start to think about blockchain as a decentralized, democratizing technology um, and as a registry of truth or a record of creative ownership uh, from past to future and a way, a way of keeping track of things where um, not just the provenance of objects where we we know that we want to, to keep a record of an artist who definitely made a work and sold it at a point in time, but, but a system of ownership that would allow us to uh, have artists participate in that. And, and I'm always reminded of, um, even on the market side, how ephemeral and human the, the origin point of all of these artworks was. So if this is one of the first works of our modern era to sell at a marquee price. This is a Jasper Johns that sold privately from Burton and Emily Hall Tremaine to the Whitney in 1980 for the then astronomical sum of $1 million. And if you look in archives, that record is on an index card that Mrs. Tremaine kept. And um, all the art information is on the front and the money is on the back. Um, because it seems gauche to mention them at the same time. So it just says Whitney, 1980, in the, in the corner. And um, so it's possible, um, and this is the research I do, that you might have artists get paid less when their work is first sold, become equity holders, and then receive proceeds when things sell at auction. And it's possible that blockchain could enable such a fractionalized system and also enable secondary trading in shares in, in these fractions. So allow artists to participate in market-driven patronage, um, but also to uh, allow collectors to diversify. Um, and uh, that's the starting point I really want to leave us with, which is um, the idea that you might be waiting for ice cream at Friendly's and have an insight that leads to this conversation and many others or that you might be Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg in 1954, uh, many years before you got gallery representation, 
many years before you even first started selling work, um, and that there's a market side to that work um, where if you retained equity, you would outperform the U.S. stock market by between two and 980 times. Um, but there's a human side, and a human side to the way this work has come into being, and I think blockchain is a very fascinating technology to explore uh, in that context. So that's, that, that is the, uh, the introduction I wanted to offer with my thanks again um, for the invitation to be here and to all of you for, for being here this evening. Next up, we have Nana. Thank you, Amy. It's always fascinating to listen to uh, someone who teaches because, yeah, no, really. Uh, Louisa Woodruby is here. There you are. Um, I'm very happy you're here because now you see what you started <laughs> at the Frick Collection. Um, so I'm also going to tell you a little bit. I think I pushed this one. There we go. So I want to tell you a little bit about uh, not only blockchain, I also want to warn you a little bit about blockchain and I'm going to tell you a little bit what's going on in the world of blockchain and art. So my life changed substantially uh, because I met professionally someone who is very important here in this room. Uh, his name is Hassel Plekner and you see him on the right um, in front of a Monet and also I met merely by coincidence, purely by coincidence in 1998 uh, when he was not an art collector yet, and I was incredibly lucky that he actually started to get obsessed with art in, a, in the best possible way, and he became one of the largest collectors in the world. At that time, nobody knew it. Um, we kept it really quiet. He didn't want to be known as an art collector. And as you all know, in this room at least, a couple of years ago, his private museum opened in Potsdam, called the Museum Barberini, which you have to see, where you see lots of his important artworks, usually in juxtaposition with artworks from other collections. Well, if you go to the left, maybe you recognize me as, sorry, Louise, if this is very close to what I said at the Frick, but Joanne told me to stay as close to that <laughs> lecture over there. So if you recognize me here on the left, it's a long time ago, I have to say, but it's also in a previous career as an art dealer. At that time, I actually worked at the Wildenstein Gallery, and I had already met Hasso Plattner, as a private dealer myself. I was actually doing research on provenance for people who wanted to buy art. And Hasso became, as I said, obsessed with French Impressionism, and I'm holding here a Monet with the Dutch subject, Windmills in Zandam, and uh, I look like the quintessential art dealer in this coat that basically says, trust me, um, I'm not from the street, and whatever I say is true. And that brings me to what was actually the reason why Hasso started to buy from me? A very bad reason, he trusted me. Uh, why did he trust me? For subjective reasons, because I came from Holland. You know, in the end, if you have to trust someone, you come up with awkward reasons why you actually trust someone. But what you forget is, why do you trust someone? And Hasso is for, well, you know much better than I do, but Hasso is not someone who has a lot of time. So he just tells it as it is. I'm Dutch, I'm used to it, but he can even be more blunt than many Dutch people. And basically what he said is, the reason that I have to trust you is because you don't give me all the details. There's not a lot, there's not a lot that I actually know. And that's the scary part of art, is that you have to trust a lot of people because most of the information about artworks is dispersed. It's dispersed among the academic world, I'm again looking at Louisa in big filing cabinets at the Frick, uh, and other museums, historical archives, different dealers, different auction houses, etc. So information about one artwork can be dispersed, and that's why you actually have to trust someone with a coat like that, and that's me. Um, here you actually, sorry, I have to go back one more slide, because that my coat is also represented in the architecture of the gallery where I used to work in those days, by the Wildenstein Gallery. Why does it look like a bank? Why does it look like it's almost a, a, a palatial building? Because you have to be convinced that you can trust these people. And archives and libraries push it even a little bit further. They have lines in front, like, you know, 
really? Do, do you want to doubt the information that we have here? And it's not only about that building, right? It's especially about the people working in that building, the supreme academic people who have access to archives that other people cannot even enter. I mean, that's what you need. That's what you need to defend with a line. But as we all know, things changed. Um, I'm showing you the Très Grand Bibliothèque in Paris. Uh, most people have seen it. It's a bit of an eyesore. But the reason, why, the reason why I use it here is the analogy of transparency. So this was built, it was designed in the 70s, and I think it was built at the late 70s. And what does it say? This is the National Archive of France. It actually says, our patrimoine, our, our, um, our, our treasures of our nation, uh, all the trust and all the important facts of our nations can actually be shared with everyone. No lines to be seen, it's all transparent. And this is actually a design of a library in China not too long ago. And you have, I'm sure you've all seen in modern buildings, and unfortunately in this country they don't spend a lot of money on infrastructure, but in Europe you see many buildings that are actually paid for by states with national archives in the most incredible architecture and it all symbolizes transparency and openness. So the world has changed. Um, so if you look at all this dispersed information that's out there, I hope I was clear in the way I tried to explain it, right? All these different dealers, archives, etc. And everybody tries to hold their cards close to their, ch their chest. The academic world doesn't necessarily like to share information before it's published. Art uh, dealers definitely don't want to share a lot of uh, information because there's actually a trade-up to keeping information to yourself, especially financial information for how much have you actually uh, bought the work. And I'm not saying most dealers do it, but some dealers do it. It's also sometimes quite convenient not to tell your client that there's also a negative uh, publication about the authenticity of that artwork. So you have to start to organize it, and I'm a fervent believer in organizing things. This is how you organize your wardrobe, right? I mean, the white shirts, the black shirts, and the red shirts. And that already creates a shirt in order. By the way, don't look at my place, but some people do it this way. For the art world, it should look like this. I don't know if anyone recognizes this hanger. Uh, if you live in New York, you, I love this, this invention. It's actually for people with small closet space, and most people in New York have small closet space. You hang your clothes, and then you you lower the hanger on the right, and then it becomes flat, so you can you can have, you have more storage space. But what it actually what I want to use it for is this is actually what you want to know about an artwork, and it should be linked together. You see these little cords that that you won't steal it in the store. So there can be a restoration report, there can be a validation, there can be a record of sale, and that can be connected, and it should stick together. So. To, I will become concrete, I promise, at a certain moment, but I love analogies. So, uh, I'm the lucky owner of a, a farm in Italy and not so lucky owner of this very old Hyundai Santa Fe, which was built in 2004. It's completely beaten up. Uh, also, my kids don't have the age anymore that I actually believe it's a nice car, which they did was so sweet when they were two and three. But this car is, uh, is beaten up. But that car comes with a little booklet, which is in Italy and in most countries in Europe, a legal document. And what does it say in the, in, in the booklet? It shows every year that the car needs to go to the garage and the report of the garage, what was wrong or what happened to the car, all the reparations, etc. That in combination with the fact that the car is actually numbered, uh, I always call it the chassis number, but I invent English words sometimes, but uh, you know what I mean, the number for that uh, car is a unique number and the condition of the car is completely known. Well, we have decided to sell the car. Um, the garage told us it's maybe worth eight to 900 euros, but the person who's paying 900 euros for that car, or 800 euros, is getting all the knowledge and all the, all the conditions, the, all the reports from, from the garage, several garages of that car. And you, that person will actually know that he's building or she's buying a beaten up car and that they basically st should stay away from it. <laughs> and that's much more information, you know, where I'm heading to 
about that painting because that painting is still, uh, in many case, occasions, built on trust. So, needless to say that I'm invited here because I have something to do with blockchain. And if you have had a very big client uh, for many years who told you, no, no, I don't necessarily believe what you're telling me, and there are better solutions out there, and that client happens to be a major innovator in the tech world, and especially in the world of databases, and I'm sure Christoph Meiner can tell you much more about that, but he is an incredibly innovative person, and uh, someone who very much believes in transparency. Well, his background, his knowledge, and then his love for art, and my love for art, and also the fact that as a dealer, it's not only a blessing that you always have to be trusted, it's in a way also a burden, and you realize um, how much more confidence you could actually give to people buying art if you could would be able to give them better documentation. So that's what uh, Artry is based on. Uh, we have created a registry, and I will tell you in a second uh, how we use blockchain, but I'm proud to say that we actually went live uh, with the soft launch. We were very, very happy and proud that uh, Christie's chose us to do the registration of one of the most important collections of American art that ever came to the market. And all these artworks are actually registered with Artry and all that information lives in blockchain now. So how does it work? The most important thing is that I don't believe in self-regulation. I very much believe that, that, that you cannot throw away all the knowledge that's out there in the academic world and in the, in the, in the scholarly world and in the, in the art trade. So you need a certain moment where you start to create a record of information. And I, wouldn't, I don't believe that you should leave that to everyone who actually owns an artwork. You need to start with information that you somehow or another can trust because due diligence processes have taken place. For me, due diligence processes are really important because then you can actually see that at least efforts were made to get the right information out there. It doesn't mean that it's right. It only means that the right amount of effort was made. The other thing what I like about due diligence is that I've worked at Sotheby's for many years. Of course, you always find out which legal entity owns it and which legal entity buys it. And of course you make mistakes sometimes, but our huge legal departments actually try to do their best. So you need a record, and where we start is, for example, a record of sale. And that's what happens with Christie's, right? There's a record of sale. Christie's accumulated information about an artwork. They published it online, and that information actually flows into our systems at Artry with an API. An API means that we don't create information, we get their information through basically a connection with the auction house, and they cryptographically sign off on it, meaning we can't change anything. And that information is hashed and goes into the blockchain. And what Amy just said is, it's this, this distributed ledger. It means that it's rewritten and rewritten and rewritten and rewritten, and there is currently, and most likely never, a way to hack that. I'm not saying it's that, that, there, that, that there will not be problems with blockchain, but if it's ever going to be hacked, it's going to be a new way of hacking, which we will see in maybe 10 years how that looks like, but we don't know yet. So that information is visible on our public registry. But whatever's in the blockchain, you can't see. It's hashed. It's not that you can just look up something in the blockchain. But what you can do is you can connect a public registry like ours with information that's hashed and in the blockchain. Meaning that if someone would hack our systems, which will happen because that's traditional kind of hacking, and will manipulate something or in a record, you can see through validation with blockchain that something has been changed. So it's more like a backup. We use it in a very traditional way. Then uh, you create an immutable record of creation, and it's not only immutable, it's also timestamped. So the statement uh, that, that a certain auction house or catalog resume committee made becomes an immutable timestamped record. So it becomes evidence that the 24th of March 2018, this was the, the, 
uh, the, uh, the common opinion on this artwork. And that's what we try to make visible, or that we actually make visible. Well, if you want to aggregate information that's uh, significant and important about an artwork, the last thing you want is that the owner is known, because the owner will never allow you. I mean, most owners will not allow you to, to put all the information about their artwork online in a public registry. But the moment you disconnect the owner, and the, un and the owner becomes an unknown owner to Artry, there is actually a way that you can get market players like Christie's on your side to work with us and to create transparency in the marketplace. Well, I brought something because, of course, we want the owner to engage with Artree. And how does that work? We created a very old-fashioned credit-like card that will be given, that is actually momentarily being given, by Christie's to the people who've paid for their artworks from the, from the Appsworth collection. And you can get into our system by either using a monomic code or the barcode. And you hold it in front of the camera of your lens of your computer and you get into the system. Next to that, we've created a wallet, the art wallet, so you can download, of course, all these cards in one system, which is only for you because it can only be accessible with your finger, finger, fingerprint or these days with your image recognition. And, uh, and that allows you to engage anonymously with a platform where the information of your artwork is actually visible. And that's something with other techniques that tie into uh, blockchain can actually give you the opportunity to reach out for us anonymously, anonymously to an insurance company who says, hey, your artwork is on a public registry. I know everything about the artwork. I actually know everything about your collection so you can get a better premium, just one example. So anonymous ownership is something which, to my opinion, is really important if you want to create a credible uh, registry with meaningful information. So this is more how that looks on the back end. I won't bore you with this, but it's a uh, partner key means that Christie's has a certain key, and you as the anonymous owner have a certain key, and they match. And we are the matchmaker because we have one part of the key, the Christie's key, and you have the other part of the key, and that connects you without know, us knowing who you are. So we're live. Um, what you will have see in the future, and I will keep it really short because I can see that Sophie is getting uh, impatient here, but so what you can see in the future is that every record that's being created about that artwork will be visible, and every new owner of that information will get a unique card to connect with the system and that person is also able to show I actually own this artwork and together with your bill of sale it actually shows that you have title of the artwork. So Amy already mentioned for contemporary artists which is of course great, great use case because then you're not dependent on statements that other people made, it's actually the artist himself herself who says, I created this artwork, this is the title I gave it, and this is, to my opinion, the most important information that should be connected to this artwork. Next to that, the artist can trace it in the future, can track their artworks for resale rights, etc. So it's a unique system, but it also works for any unique piece that is created or any piece that's part of multiples. For example, I don't even know what kind of a watch it is, but most likely very, very expensive. But this watch, uh, let's say there are 2,000 made, and they all have a unique number, and those works could immediately go into blockchain, and the owners would actually get the cards that they own the work. And if you're mugged in Barcelona and your uh, watch is stolen, you don't have to look for your bill of sale, which you don't have anymore. This is exactly what happened to me, actually. Uh, and nobody has to trust you anymore in the store. Oh, I really bought that watch here, and it's stolen now. No, you just say, that's my watch, this is my card, it's stolen, and your insurance company will most likely pay you the full premium. So, what is important here? What really important is supply chain, right? Whether it's a artwork, or a watch, or a medical record, for example, you want to make sure that every step in the supply chain is recorded. And if you buy tuna at Whole Foods, uh, the chances are very big 
that whole fuchs knows exactly where the tuna was caught and all the different stages where it was. Refrigerator ship here, a storage there, and then to me, and then on your plate. That's the only part you don't know. But the big problem and the big challenge with the art world is that uh, people catch tuna, they, <laughs> they, they catch for tuna, they actually catch herring and they sell it as tuna. So that's why I feel blockchain in the art world is an incredible combination, but it's very much dependent on the information that you actually put in the blockchain. And I've used uh, rougher terms than that in other speeches, but I always say, and I now I will say that the, the clean version is rubbish in, rubbish out. Thank you. <laughs> Our final talk, uh, Professor Meinl, please. So, new blockchain sitting in Nevada. There are more. World Economic Forum. Blockchain as a solution to environmental issues. Blockchain in Thailand's main opposition party holds primary election on blockchain. A new DNA sequencing service wants to reward you sharing your data with blockchain. Malaysia launches blockchain certificate verification to combat degree fraud. Will blockchain create a more transparent art market or merely entity more investors? So what kind of newspaper you take, what kind of journal you take, blockchain, blockchain, blockchain. What was your last uh, title, The Holy? The Holy Grail. The Holy Grail. What's behind? Blockchain, where they come from, is the situation that we have networks, networks of people, larger networks, whether it's in the supply chain, whether it's the art market, whether it's in the production, whether it's an archive, where we have many different players. And the players interact with each other. And they do this as peer-to-peer. -peer. They do this in a way that there is no boss. Exactly looks who is doing what, have records about that. Now, the system should work where people interact and where is no trust. This is the basic idea. Can we provide a solution for interacting in such a network without someone who guarantees that what's going on is going on? So in this distributed networks it comes from. So this is peer-to-peer -peer networks and all the peers interact with each other in a time sequence. And the idea is to record all the transactions and to melt them in a way that no one can cheat and later on say, no, there was another transaction or I was not involved. So the idea is here to have a cost saving. There is no one in the middle who is uh, uh, like a referee who looks and exactly uh, is a witness of all what's going on. So it saves money. It should be reliable. Everyone, also the people do not trust each other. They do not know each other, do not trust each other. Everyone should be clear that what is done uh, is the reality. And the idea is, I will come later to, on, to show this, to put all this transaction together to form blocks, then to interconnect the blocks to a chain, so that all what's happened, each transaction that happens in the network, uh, can be seen and cannot be changed and is clear. At the end, if we have such a structure, we can have smart contracts. We can have, for example, in a real life, there is a bank. You want to buy a house, there is the seller, there is the one who sells the house, and then there is a notary, as a third party, which says, 
send the money to me, and in the moment I receive the money, I say to the house owner, I have the money for you, now you can over the house to the, so the man in the middle is, is a trust center. And we want to delete this. We want to make such kind of interaction in the same way, same true like in this case. So this is the, what's technically happened. There is working over the internet. This is the lower level. Then there is a blockchain architecture using the internet. And then there are different blockchain applications. Blockchain became famous because it was a techno technology that was used in the Bitcoin. My personal uh, assumption is that this connection makes blockchain so famous. The fantasy because of this cryptocurrency was so big that the people did not distinguish between this cryptocurrency and the technology below the blockchain. But nevertheless, now blockchain we have and found a lot of applications. There are different, here in this case, Bitcoin, different applications, Ethereum. There are a lot of other things, like, for example, artery registry. So this blockchain technology, how does it work? Let's take the Bitcoin example, because it's so nice in this network, the people want to send money to another party. Each one in the peer-to-peer -peer network is a receiver of money and spends money for something. So there is a value. The value are transported from one member in the network to another. This is a transaction. If someone spends money for another, it's a transaction. It's a value, it's a, in this case, a coin. And then if we look to all what's going on in this network, then there are a lot of transactions. Transactions from different parties uh, are in this way. This, all these transactions are collected into blocks. A transaction is kind of input. I get some money and I spend some money. These are the records of what's going on with the uh, money exchange. This is transaction, so we have many, many transactions and these transactions are smelled together into blocks. Now it would be easy if someone has access to this block to change the transaction, to change the value. I received less than I really received, and then I claim I didn't receive it. So what needs to be done is to connect all this transaction in a way that no one in this network can cheat the others. Typically, there is a bank, and the bank looks that all works in a correct way. But our idea is to organize this without a bank, without a trust center. No one needs to trust the others, but all have to trust that in this block, the transactions are all the transactions in the right way, with the right value, unmanipulated, uh, uh, connected together. And then, such blocks, here you see it, this is header, there is hash function, there is cryptographic. So trust is replaced by cryptographic functionality. And then blocks are interconnected because more and more transactions happen and after a while the next block is coming. And in this way, here you see the blocks, there are the interconnections of all the Actions and application of cryptographic methods, different methods, digital signature, uh, asymmetric uh, public key cryptography, macro tree, you saw. With these methods, the system works without a center. This is all about the blockchain. So it's 
then a replacement of a replacement of trust by cryptography. Yeah. The welding to form the blocks. This is really where the problem is. In. So this is called mining, melting, and there are different methods to create such blocks. To create such blocks in such a way that all the people, all the peers, can trust that this block is exactly a reflection of all what's going on in the network. There are different methods for the smelting, for the smelting. Uh, in any case, the, there is a competition of producing such blocks. There has to be solved a cryptographic secret, and this is a very complicated process. And the consensus comes on different, different methods. Here, with this very energy intensive, it is the, a consensus of uh, algorithms by proof of work and a uh, huge computing center are needed, huge energy is needed uh, to do this. If we look for blockchain application in the arts, then we hear that there are many characteristics of an, of an uh, artwork, many documents, also exhibitions, auctions, content, style, so a lot of information around, and what we heard with the artery application is, these uh, information are connected together to describe, uh, to uh, characterize the provenance of an artwork. Here, for example, blockchain, a uh, basic artist. The artist can register the copyright and the provenance information for the art supporting digital uh, certificate of authority. There are, um, there are various art uh, platform uh, to collect such information. There are new business opportunities for the artists themselves and for the collectors to create digital art uh, and crypto collections. For example, the rare bits or the snark art. If some example, there is uh, applications in art, publicity, available art, and uh, contemporary rich registry, uh, Christie's and Artery, we saw this example. This is a collection of all these uh, documents characterizing an artwork which are interconnected in such a blockchain. There is in the Russian art gallery, Tretyakov, uh, with uh, riddle and code, an application blockchain-based art, patronage and purchase, to uh, use this technology that from the different sources, which are independent from each other, without trust, to form of a blockchain, a connection of the art, of the art piece, with all the documents around, which could give a hint that this is uh, true and original. If you like to go deeper into the technique of blockchain, then I, Johan already mentioned this, I show, uh, I, I can uh, point you to openhpi.de, where massive open online course is available, which explains the blockchain technology in much more detail. And of course, there is a lot of cryptographic technology behind that has to brought in right order and this does not fit in the 12 minutes. <laughs>
Um, so thank you. You know, we're, we're going to talk a bit more also just about art and, and blockchain. Um, you know, I think something that you know I'd like to talk about is, is sort of the success of blockchain already in digital art and collectibles market. You pointed out a couple of things. Um, but for example, uh, for the audience in September, someone spent $170,000 for a unique digital drawing of a cat uh, on CryptoKitties, right? Um, so this is someone who really believed this is a unique original drawing and I own it and no one else can own it. Um, but in terms of physical works, you know, just this summer, someone claiming to be Leonardo da Vinci uploaded an image of the Mona Lisa onto the art blockchain database Ferris Art, and he received a certificate of authenticity um, for this act, right? So my question is, is, is blockchain and art useless unless you can ensure that what is on the digital ledger actually corresponds to a unique piece? Well, uh, uh, allow me to say it so that you don't have to speak on behalf of your, your own company. Um, yes, I, I think this is a huge question, and um, I think the, the gentleman in the front row who raised a technological point, I think um, the, the, the difference between the protocols, I think uh, Dr. Meinel covered, but, but you're absolutely right to, to raise um, the importance of the specificity beyond the first uh, 12 minutes. Um, that, that there are different answers to this question depending on whether you're looking at blockchain or Ethereum protocols, but that absolutely, um, Terence Eden, the, the gentleman who listed the Mona Lisa, and I'm not even sure he listed the correct made-by date. I, it's like 1506 and not 03 to 07. Uh, but um, I think that one of the things I have really admired about Artery, and I, I say this sincerely and not to be flattering um, to my fellow catalyst, is that you have figured out how to have vetted entry points to the blockchain. And I think this is the good news, bad news of an immutable record is that um, once it's there, it's there. And so this is all new for all of us. Um, but at the same time, we're doing things that the benefit of which is that they're permanent. So I think the approach of Artery where they're vetted partners, uh, sort of like this, these systems like Airbnb where, where you trust someone who's a host because they've been crowd vetted, um, we trust uh, Christie's or a large gallery or a well-known appraiser. And I think the other vetted parties, not historically, but going forward could also be artists who issue work directly out of their studio. Um, but foremost, I think you need, you need to protect that point of vetting. Um, and that once that's done, um, I think the, the blockchain, I mean, it will be interesting and wonky, like all great, uh, inventions from democracy on down, um, but that I, I absolutely think it, it's possible. So I, th I think the public part is so important. Um, listen, it's easy to, to make jokes about Fears Art. I think what they're doing is great. Um, I personally believe very much that you need vetted partners, especially if you talk about art that of which the creator is not living anymore, but that's not the ambition of Fears Art. It's very ironic, of course, that a so-called Leonardo da Vinci talking about authenticity ended up on that. Uh, it's, it's so funny on so many levels. But anyway, that's not what I wanted to say. I wanted to say the public nature of a registry is important. You can also there are also companies creating registries that are not public. God knows what's going on over there, and they use blockchain um, as the holy grail. They say because there's blockchain involved, it's actually more reliable, which I don't think it is. But I have a lot of people telling me, non at the moment, a forgery occurs on artery, you're out of business. And they always say, no, we pop open the champagne. It works. It means that more people can actually see the statements of players in the art world. And more people can actually see that maybe things are wrong so every now and then, which is much better than having a forgery hanging on the wall for four generations in someone's house. Um, to to, um, to elaborate sort of on your, your decision to um, not allow just anyone to upload a work of art um, onto your platform. Um, you know, if blockchain is sort of all about decentralization, right, meaning that no single authority oversees what's actually going on, um, does this mean that we're going to continue to rely on the same powerful institutions that we're actually trying to get some independence from? You know, so how important is decentralization to blockchain in the art world? Yeah, I, I think ultimately it will be a different world. 
initially, of course, you need the people who have the knowledge and who have built up a system for hundreds of years, whereas the system is uh, impeccable or not. It's, it's not. it's not flawless, we all know that. But ultimately, I think the consumer needs to impose it on a marketplace. It's not us, right? It's a, first of all, we don't decide who we're going to work with. That should be an independent committee. It was sort of a no-brainer that when Christie's asked that we said yes. But ultimately, we do need an, an independent committee to decide which market players can, can work with us. But more importantly, if you, all of you, at a certain moment go to your dealer and you buy something, and I just did it myself, I'm the chairman of TEFA, what do I do? I buy two photographs at the last fair, and my price range is like $20,000, not the multi-million dollar piece, and I had to trust the woman who sold me the works, because I like them so much. But if, and she told me, yeah, it's really, it's an edition of 10, and there I go, uh, founder, co-owner of Artery, uh, chairman of TEFOF with stringent vetting procedures, and there I go. I, I, I fell in love with these two artworks and I bought them. should not be necessary. In a, in a, I, I'm absolutely convinced if the big market players start to endorse this, ultimately it's us. We have to endorse it. We have to buy something and say, I want, I want this to register. Uh, otherwise I just don't buy it. That's it. That edition of 10 and 25 artists. Um, no, I, I think that on the one hand, I, I want there to be a world of human trust, and on the other hand, I, I completely agree with you, and I, I do research in archives, so I see the resale certificates from 1965, where there's a typed, typed number, but um, one of the things I, I think kind of in response to that is that it's not just um, in the art world, but what's so interesting about blockchain is that in order to look at its applications in the arts, one also looks at its applications in other fields. And I, I was thinking about this in, in response to your, your talk, because in some ways, um, blockchain is a kind of post-sector, post-nation state technology. So there's almost a question, not just how can you use blockchain in the arts, but why is the same company not able to manage art and supply chains? And why, why do you have different blockchain protocols in different industries. And I think, you know, even, and, and this, I love this Wunderbar um, Together logo, but like even the, the nation state, I mean, there are people talking about, you know, post self-sovereign ID cards on blockchain. And so I think these points, just to highlight these points about governance um, and privacy or public registry of blockchains, I think they're so important. And I'm really curious because I think we can learn so much about the arts from how blockchain exists in many industries, and how, and I'm curious kind of what your your perspective is on is on that too. So the uh, blockchain technology, there are a lot of startups, a lot of uh, activities trying out where you have, for example, in a logistic problem, supply chain, many different parties, which are involved in providing, producing a car, for example. So and in the moment, there is an organization that one piece is sent over to the next company, the next company has to restate that it is get it. Is then from many, many other uh, suppliers, such things are delivered. And the question is, can this be organized in a way which is much more efficient and uses, much more efficient and uses uh, and provides the same quality of trust. So it becomes useful if there are many parties involved which act independently. And for that reason, you have not the trust technique in place. Not that the people are mistrusted, uh, but there are so many. So you do not know, you have no experience that this is. So there are different uh, applications in all fields where many parties cooperate together. But we, what we have also to say is a lot of projects started, a lot of startups were created. And meanwhile, we see not all are successful. Of course, to really use such blockchain technology is very, becomes very uh, expensive if 
many, many uh, parties are involved. And the reason is, create this trust, this cryptographic, uh, cryptographic application of all these methods, this block forming, the block forming in a kind of competition. There are many players producing uh, such blocks. The first one is the accepted one. Have to solve a problem there. So the problem is to provide this consensus. There are different ideas how to do this, and one idea is I showed this as proof of work is that the one put a lot of effort, used a lot of computational power to to melt this uh, transaction. That's not a trust. So meanwhile, we see that the basic idea to have really a peer-to-peer -peer network without any authority, there are also applications of blockchain where this is no more in place, where there are only a few points which are able to produce this block. Uh, became in a role of authorities. There are unpublic blockchain. One has to see for the different applications what fit best. So we are in a phase between hype and really true that this is the whole group. So how quickly do you think blockchain will catch on in the art world? Sort of what means we've made it, you know, this is success. Um, obviously when, when artery is uh, <laughs> this, the gold standard, but what, what does that mean for you? Um, not in terms of how many years, but what, what is really the metric we're looking for here? So I start? First of all, the art world needs to understand what it actually is. That's the most important thing. Um, I think actually the conference last February in London that Christie's organized was a very important event where a lot of people in the art world came together with a lot of tech people. But you have to understand what it actually is, not necessarily how it works. I'm always so surprised that everybody asks me, how does it work? I have no idea. But I also don't know and I don't want to know how my cell phone works, but I do know what I want to do on my cell phone. So I do want to know what blockchain actually achieves. And that use case is incredibly important. What worries me a lot, and I think when that is fixed, uh, then the art world will actually start to endorse it much more, is that a lot of people who had nothing to do with the art world looked at, this, looked at it as a huge business opportunity because it sounds too good to be true, an opaque market, and blockchain can actually make that whole world less opaque, and you can create a new uh, trade channel using blockchain technology with actually disrupting the whole art market. I'm maybe too old to believe that that will happen. Um, I honestly spoke, yes, I'm old, but I also believe that I know a lot about art and the art world. I think if you create a product, you have to make sure that the people who ultimately need to use it understand what it is. I'm not proud of this card. I mean, can I pull it out one more time? <laughs> can you believe it? A card, like a credit card, that you get from Christie's? Do you, do you really believe we can do better these days? Of course, we can do much better, but people won't understand it. So that's why you need a hybrid before you start to really use the products that we've actually already developed. Um, actually, it, it was Professor Meinl one day who, 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 who I heard in a lecture where he spoke about this legal, um, this legal anonymous entity that can actually start to interact and actually you spend much more money for higher amounts without having to use a credit card. And what does art we do? We actually create a new credit card. So long story short, the moment the art market starts to understand that it's not only a huge threat, but it can actually help them to increase the value in the end. These are businesses, right? They, the art market, sorry, I have to say this because this is something that most people don't actually know. The art market, first of all, is very small. 65 billion dollar only when you live and work in the art world which i've done for so many years you actually think you're important and that that you're part of a huge business you're not it's a very small business 
a mediocre software company like Dell makes exactly the same kind of revenue and people spend more money in hotels in the state of California than the $65 billion that we claim is a big art market. It's fine, it's a small market, but really dangerous or, or threatening for the market should be, but they don't even look at it, they don't even think about it. It's a, it, the market gets smaller. It's 10% smaller than it was 10 years ago, and even more threatening, and again, nobody thinks about it in the art world because we all live in that bubble and think about, because of someone like Hasso Plattner, I was, I could actually leave that bubble and, and start something new, which I really enjoy. But if you're in the bubble, you don't see that there are very threatening numbers. There are less transactions, many more less than there were 10 years ago. And all the big expenditure is at the highest echelon of the market, where you don't make money, because that's where the biggest competition is. So the only way to actually expand the market is, or to make more money in the market, is not by selling more expensive paintings, but is just to find new people who buy art. And the most interesting, most interesting thing about the art market is it's the only market where nobody ever looks for new clients. They only cater to the people they already know, and that's what needs to happen. And these new blockchain companies that only look at it from a tech perspective, they believe that all of a sudden, miraculously enough, a whole new generation of tech-savvy people will start buying art. It's not going to happen. Sorry, but a lot of, there are not a lot of people in Silicon Valley who buy art. So why will they all of a sudden start to buy art because there's a new technology involved? So I think you have to endorse new technology, but it has to come from the marketplace itself. Amen. Amen. Regardless <laughs> whether a blockchain technology will really become important uh, here or also thinking about applying blockchain in connected to art in the art market. It's, it drives digitalization. Digitalization of all the arguments of the archives and other things. So this is a value for itself. Of course, in this way, the accessibility of this data increases a lot. The publicity increases a lot, which is now behind big walls very difficult to have to travel to a certain place to go into the archive and access over the internet. This uh, blockchain application is one part of this technologi technological drive. It's interesting, just to add to that, um, my own introduction to blockchain is a little bit of a microcosm of what we're discussing, which is that I was invited around 2011, 2012, so right when these internet companies were coming online at RT and Paddle 8, that were trying to then expand the audience for art mystically through technology. And I was invited to be in an artist working group to study what property meant for artists. And we met the first time and we went around the room and everyone would introduce themselves and they were like, I'm a Marxist, I'm a Marxist and a statistician. And I was like, I have an MBA and I teach at the Sotheby's Institute. And um, this artist, William Paul Haida, who was in the group, made a very funny joke I no longer remember, but it caused me to refer to the group as Marxists and cynics for a long time, um, to them affectionately. Uh, and we eventually published a book because um, we needed to stop meeting two and a half years later. And I wrote a piece for it on property rights for artists and resale royalties as forms of ownership and then somehow met uh, a blockchain entrepreneur about three months later. I was supposed to, I, a mentor of mine said, would you help this person be introduced into the arts? Uh, this has some art applications among many, many others. And I said, sure, but I should meet him first um, and see what he's working on. And um, so I feel like I was privy to a lot of conversations that happened in this space in 2015, where you would walk in and speak to someone who is, um, let's just say, the general counsel of a large entity in the art field. And they would, they would be, uh, I think we've all experienced this, uh, fearful yet dismissive. Um, and it would feel abstract, like I don't understand how this applies to me, and I think that in and of itself has changed so much, but the technology has also evolved so much since then. So um, th you know, those companies were built on a Bitcoin protocol, many more now are built on an Ethereum protocol, and some of those early companies have risen and, and ebbed. Uh, 
some of them have risen and they're still going. Um, but I, I do not know the answer to this question of how blockchain will be adapted in the arts. I, I genuinely don't know the answer. I think it is entirely possible that a company like Artery that artfully, um, and I, I have no interest in saying this, I have no, no I have no conscience of interest in saying this. Uh, I do not own one of those cards. Um, I, I think that um, there's something about it that is uh, digestible by the art world as it is uh, because of the protection of privacy of collectors and the uh, simpatico nature with current processes of appraisal of art. And so I think that it's possible that once um, it becomes understood by use, um, and I agree with you about the, not understanding my cell phone, uh, I'm very privileged to interact with technologists who program uh, their own blockchain um, and, uh, and who are patient when I sound like a third grader describing the technology in front of them. Uh, but I think that um, we will have to make a lot of decisions as a field, and they will also be decisions about how broad the field is and how many people are included in the conversation around art and how much art is explained to it, uh, explainable and joyful and human to a broader public. And nobody gets to make those decisions. Those are democratically held decisions or they're elite judiciary decisions by tastemakers in the arts. And I think that, as much as anything, will drive the technological adoption. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to be opening it up to questions from the audience now. Um, so anyone with a question, gentleman in the gray? I, I was wondering if you could speak to the concept of rare digital art, maybe more deeply than CryptoKitties, and what effect that could have on the production of art. Are you saying rare? Yeah. Like super rare? Yeah, like yeah. rare digital art. Okay. Um, uh, I, I am not an expert in that topic, but if I understand your question correctly, um, how could someone talk in general about digital collectibles and the ERC-721 protocol on the Ethereum blockchain? Is that fair or do you mean rare? Because I, I may not be the best person to answer that. I guess I mean the idea that you could create a work of digital art and certify it as the original work of art. It increases in value where copies don't. Yeah, I mean, I, I think digital scarcity is a core use case in in uh, blockchain in the arts. And some of the earlier companies that were doing this were companies like Monograph, which was founded by a colleague of mine at NYU, Kevin McCoy. And they allowed artists to post digital art. And by posting it, they could control the edition size. And they could also control the licensing rights. Um, but the edition size, so controlling for scarcity, digitally completely, arguably transforms uh, the economics of digital art, which before had huge kind of piracy uh, issues or kind of complex, here's the CD-ROM, but this is a major work of art kinds of delivery issues as well. And so I, I think, um, you know, I'm sure uh, Nana could speak uh, to the sort of uh, connoisseurship side far, far more than I could, but economically, you know, the idea of scarcity allows one to control for value. So it's a form of knowing that the addition size is 10, and that some of the early companies doing this were companies like uh, Monograph, and then there were artists, and thinking of Sarah Miojas's work, uh, she created something called Bitcoin, where she created a currency based on a certain uh, square inch size of her own artwork. Um, the companies that are in that space now, I think some of them have quite complex or Cirque du Soleil balletic economics like Dada, which allows people to create work digitally, is quite complicated because people create work collaboratively. So who owns it? How do they own it? What do the contracts look like? And what's the jump between making work collaboratively and then creating an, an addition that's sold on the blockchain, which is what they have done uh, recently. So I think uh, for me, the core takeaway that kind of connects back to some of the larger themes is that if, if we're looking at an Ethereum protocol and this uh, non-fungible token, so there, there are two core Ethereum protocols, an ERC-20, which functions like cash, and an ERC-721, which functions uh, essentially like an artwork, 
in being related, but I, I uh, individualistic or um, sort of like I own this Warhol and you own that Warhol, but they're kind of related. Um, I think those things in a funny way allow the arts to be a sandbox in which to develop ways of understanding value in the rest of the blockchain universe. Because any ICO or initial coin offering actually functions in many ways like the valuation for a work of art. So I think the scarcity absolutely will have that effect and others could comment more than I could. Uh, and also the technology I think actually allows the arts to contribute something to blockchain more broadly. So my question is, in the blockchain technology, will there be any necessity of having ownership title and insurance of the artwork or there's no need to have that kind of insurance? Yeah, title insurance in the arts is, is a very complicated subject, right? I mean, Aris was this big, but well, not big, small title insurance company for the arts because the moment you need title insurance for the art, artwork, it's, it, it basically means that there's a problem because why, why would you need title insurance? But, so title insurance in art is, is complicated at so many levels. The other level is actually, um, so the, the, the owner of that artwork, does he actually own title, which is very hard to, to prove because you, all you have is a bill of sale. It's not like, like a house that you buy where you can actually show that you clear, have clear title of ownership of that artwork. So, the whole, the whole definition of title in artworks is very complex. I think, otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here, that a digital registry with blockchain protection could give you actually more uh, evidence to say that you're the owner of that artwork, together still with the bill of sale. But, but you, so I think that you only meant the word insurance if it came to, to title insurance, right? That's, that's the connection, yeah. So having said that, I, I guess that companies like mine, uh, hope there will not be too many, uh, will will actually give more evidence that you actually own the piece that is in the registry that happens to be hanging on your wall and of which you actually also own uh, the bill of sale. Yeah. And I'm thank God not the only one who says that. Uh, there have been uh, some some very important lawyers in that field who we consulted. We also are in close touch with the legal departments of the two owner uh, of the two big auction houses and their legal departments also say thank god that yeah this this would actually for us to, to uh, an evidence of that uh, that the person who brings us the artwork actually owns title of that artwork um so as an artist here today listening and i worked a lot with digital technology um, one of my questions, I, I have a myriad of questions, um, but there's something related to trust that you're talking about that on a practical level and a conceptual level is really very interesting. Um, having made work digitally over a long period of time, I have a series of hard drives that no longer work in various formats. So I have information stacked up that, you know, if I was, if I just had an archive and I had the written document on the card, it um, would be there. Um, and now it's almost impossible for me to access some of my earlier work. Um, so in that, um, looking at your trust issue and your card, your, not your credit card, but your access card, um, as time goes on and as systems change, and especially in that world where there's a kind of a technological land grab when these things start, you know, when there's ownership involved, uh, you know, at a level with Christie's, there's sort of an ownership involved in that kind of technology. Um, as that changes and, and, and as people then start to kind of batten down the hatches, what is this guarantee in the future of this trust that you're talking about? Um, I'm, you know, are people going to find that suddenly in 10 years time and with the weight and the layer of all of this data that, you know, in 20, 30, 40 years, you won't even be able to access part of your archives. Well, I'm equally skeptical as you are, honestly spoken. Um, I'm, I'm literally equally skeptical as you are because I don't even use in the context of blockchain the, world, the, the word in perpetuity. 
I, I started to use, you know, this is not, I never used the word immutable, I would say this is immutable in perpetuity. We don't know. Uh, these, these kind of developments will change. And there will be at a certain moment a new hype, a new, a new product. But if we don't believe in progress, then we might as well stop altogether with developing anything. Ultimately, there will be a new kind of blockchain, and we will all be thinking, how on earth did nobody else invent this? And what you now have to do with your floppy, uh, I would run, because there are just a few people left who can actually transfer it into a different system, is maybe what you at a certain moment, my grandson will have to do with Artry, like how could my grandfather be so, so stupid? I mean, I remember myself sitting behind my first laptop and I could literally make a whole cup of coffee at every 10 minutes because I had to, to download all that whole thing started to shake. I mean, these floppies at a certain moment you have to transfer. I actually believe it's an incredible uh, solution, blockchain, and I don't think this will be... We won't be sitting here in five years and think this, is, this was all sheer madness. And as Amy so well expressed, it is explained, it's, it's, it's a rather old technology. It's not something that was invented yesterday. Um, but I also believe that there will be a new technology in the future, but I, wanna, I don't want to be so cynical that I'm not endorsing developments anymore. That's, but uh, I feel bad for your floppies, I have to say. Um, I was going to say, I think blockchain, I, I'll, I'll be very quick and then I'll... I'll uh, um, I was just going to say, I think that blockchain is, like, theoretically uh, transformative in the manner of a computer processing chip or something like democracy as a structure. And I do think with due respect to, to the institutions uh, like auction houses, museums, galleries, that ultimately artists and collectors and people are the citizens of blockchain as a decentralized democratic structure. And so, and catch me on the drinks break if you want, but just to say, uh, the Joan Mitchell Foundation has excellent resources. Um, some of them are geared toward estate planning, but they're also geared toward how to create an archive as an artist. And then um, uh, Rhizome, the nonprofit, which um, archives different forms of, of internet art uh, from, from different times. And then also, this is like the golden era for being able to mail floppy disks off or VHS tapes off and have them relatively cheaply converted by people through the interwebs, um, which I have also uh, had to do. I have like a lot of 35 millimeter slides on my desk to, to mail off. So, so I, I honor the problem and I, I um, this is a problem in modern life. I tried to unarchive a check I wrote from 10 years ago and the digital archive only goes back five years. So in some ways the blockchain is better because they're, it's more decentralized than the record if it's not immutable going forward, it's hopefully immutable going backwards. Um, and so, hope, you know, I, I, I just want to express a sense of hopefulness and also like a sharing of um, specific nuts and bolts if other people are in that same situation. Well, when it's all transferred, we will register it, I promise. <laughs> I'm not the decision maker there. We need, to, we need a trusted partner. First of all, thank you for being here. My name is Susie. Really appreciate your time. Um, kind of a, a little bit of a piggyback in regards to trust. Um, I, I think somebody earlier said uh, essentially re replacement of trust by cryptography. And so I, I don't really know much about this technology, but um, I've been kind of struggling with this, this idea of, of uh, replacement of trust. And earlier today, I just happened to be listening to a podcast called Unchained, and I think this woman, um, one of the guests, really captured it really well. And she said, um, and I'd love to know what you think about this. She said, we're putting a great deal of trust in the competence of the core developers to actually understand the technology well enough to make good decisions about what should be in the code. So I'm really curious as to what you think about that. If you look, for example, in the Bitcoin uh, context, what traditionally uh, money transfer is, there is an intermediate, intermediate player the bank and all the people around trust this bank. So they have an account there, they put their money there, and if they get the information from the bank, he receives this money, this money has paid. The question is, can one organize money transfer without a bank? 
Bitcoin, was an answer. Crypto uh, currencies are answer to this. And what they do is they have a couple of different cryptographic technologies which are applied so that all the people in the system trust the result, are sure that there is no single party that's able to cheat. In the traditional systems, the bank is an auditor, is an authority. Here, it is in the technique uh, implemented everyone can be sure that there is no manipulation possible. Cryptographic methods that are used are not new. Different cryptographic techniques, public key cryptography, hash functions, consensus technology, that they are brought together in such a nice way that with blockchain application, also proof this works. Just to say, um, I, I completely agree with uh, Professor Meinel, and I, I think that's absolutely right. I think that you know, as we encounter these bumps uh, in programmers trying to figure this stuff out, there's some notable cases, and I certainly spend a lot of time right now thinking about the terms and conditions. Because a lot of times when you sign up for a blockchain app, you are asked to give the programmers carte blanche to reprogram it. And that, that it, they are asking for that in very good faith in order to have the ability to correct their own mistakes. Um, there's a very famous case of the DAO, this uh, decentralized app that was built in the early days of Ethereum. And Literally, somebody put a line of code at, I think it was like line 749 that should have been at line 747. Um, 747 is like a weird favorite number of mine. I don't happen to have a memory for this kind of thing. Uh, but they put this line of code at 749 that should have been at 747. And what it meant was that people could create a recursive function where they could withdraw money from it, but it wasn't it was too late in the code that the fact that they had withdrawn money was logged. And so they could just withdraw money on, over and over and over again. And then a lot of people, people took advantage of this. And then the programmers who were running the DAO had to get together and decide if they wanted to have a hard fork where uh, they, they somehow moved over to a different platform so that they could make people whole or whether they wanted to accept the loss. Um, I, I'm speaking in slightly figurative terms. I understand what you're saying, sir, in the front row. Uh, so um, I, I say this having, having heard it from one of the curators of the DAO, with respect. Uh, and so you get these problems where the code uh, is uh, being trusted, um, and uh, sort of like Wikipedia, where there are certain people who are editors and many people who are users, and back to what Nani was saying about his cell phone, there's a huge governance problem of an expertise that's extremely hard to understand that we are all also reliant on. So as much as I agree with what Professor Meinel is saying about the blockchain and the, the cryptographically secure nature, it is entirely possible that there are bugs that will arise because people are programming in relatively new ways, even though some of, some of the blockchain is well understood programmatically and the cryptography is well understood, for example, the cryptographic protocol, uh, it's the, uh, I think it's an SHA-256. It used to be an SHA-1, uh, but there's a woman who found a problem with that, and they're like, yeah, we really have to fix that. Um, so, so there's a little bit of trial and error that's baked in, um, but to me, it's the governance and the terms and conditions that I think about the most, because I think that's the stuff that's tethered to the legal part of the world that we're inhabiting, that we may, we may be able to work on while we're allowing people a little bit of an artistic wide berth um, to figure out what programming works best. And I think there are amazing examples, GitHub on down, of people sharing this code. I think there's a lot of collegiality in the development of the technology, and I, you probably could speak better to that than I could. And, and if I may ask, add to your question, uh, there's also semantics involved, right? I mean, for cryptographically signing off 
is creates trust in a way. But what is the trust you create? Because this has nothing to do with crypt crypt cryptography. It's about the fact that us as middlemen, as artery, cannot alter the information that Christie's in this occasion gives to us. So that's what I mean when it, it's cryptographically signed off. It doesn't mean that that information can be trusted more. Uh, it's up to the person who looks at the information, whether you trust it or not. At least you can see where it's coming from, and that the middle person, Artree, who creates that registry cannot manipulate their, their records. We actually, I think we had a very flawless launch, but there turned out to be only one mistake, and it's actually one of the catalogers of Christie's who just found out two days ago. And she said, under the hopper, there is a part of the literature missing. Nobody else saw that before. And she was actually wondering what we have done, uh, what we have forgotten, and I had to reply in a very polite way that we will dig into it. Of course, I already knew we haven't, we haven't changed anything because we can't. So it's, it's, it's semantics, it's understanding, it's at so many levels that it's actually very interesting material. And of course, we, they found out that the information that we got and that they cryptographically signed off on, there was this omission. And maybe interesting for you to hear, what do you do then? You have to create a new block. You cannot change anything. So this, this little error is actually visible um, in, I wouldn't say it, in perpetuity. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. We're all out of time for today, um, but you know, I think we all can agree that we've come a long way with blockchain in the art world, but have a very long way to go. Um, thank you all for um, coming, for talking a bit about your work, um, and I think everyone will be hanging out a little bit for the drinks downstairs if you have any more conversations. Um, thanks very much.